We began this Know Your Soul series last time with an answer to the question, what is a soul? A soul is a gift of God's breath or spirit granted to the complex organisms in God's creation. However, last time we also learned that the human soul is corrupt. Today we're going to study the source of that corruption and also look into the many ways that that corruption manifests itself in our lives. Here are some of the observations we made from last time as we studied the question, what is a soul? Although animals, plants, and mankind all have very complex bodies, it was only animals and mankind that were given souls. Now, souls have very sophisticated built-in features or instincts which guarantee survival through adaptation, protection, uh, socialization, and reproduction. Together, these integrated features make animals and mankind autonomous. They're able to live in this world and survive and thrive in this world and be fruitful and multiply in this world because of the beauty of the complex algorithms that were built right into them. God gave each creature a very unique soul in order to manage the very unique body that every creature has. Souls are the primary energy, especially in the human soul. Are the, it's the primary energy behind personality and temperament. We behave the way we do primarily because of the way our souls are made. And souls are extremely powerful. Souls latch on to whatever becomes normal. They look for routines in life so that they can help automate the tedious tasks that we need to perform each day. This is a good thing, but we'll find later that because our souls in this power are now corrupt, we are now slaves to that power. Human souls created in, the God, in God's image also have the ability to share a moral component with God and also a spiritual component so that we can have a relationship with God, our Creator. We also listened last time to the Apostle Paul as he gave us a very logical, reasoned argument as to why, for some reason, part of our soul is in total agreement with God's law of righteousness and part of our soul rebels against that law of righteousness within us. Unfortunately, the part of us that rebels against God's law is the more powerful part. Now that we have spiritual death in our lives, we no longer have the power of God nor the power of our spirits to even uh, resist what this power of the soul and its corruption can do in our lives. Here is Paul's summary of what he discovered from Romans chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. We have a lot of scripture to talk about today, and most of it we will only be able to survey. So let's pray first and ask God's blessing, and then we're going to dig in and study the cause of soul tyranny. Heavenly Father, I pray, grant us your spirit and guide us through this passage. This could be some of the most important pieces of information and insights that any soul could ever learn. So I pray in Christ's name, amen. Let's dig right in and begin with truth or consequences. Truth or or consequences. Genesis chapter 3 is a story of the worst day in all history. You will recall that a crafty serpent used some very clever questions to sow doubt into Eve's understanding about the rule that God made about eating fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This ban was, ex was uh, clearly expressed in Genesis chapter 2 verses 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. By substituting lies for truth, Eve's ability to anticipate the consequences of moral decisions was turned upside down. God made it abundantly clear that this rule required death for its violation. However, when the serpent got done giving her some deceptive lies and to, put, to substitute for those truths, it now appeared to be advantageous to Eve to eat this fruit. Listen to Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Did Adam and Eve die? People living today who have no idea what it was like to live in a world without sin merely to find death like this, like a medical coroner's report, the body's mortal demise through some injury, disease, or aging. 
To Adam and Eve, their death was radical, monumental, and instantaneous. The changes that took place in the world at that moment were so profound that the best term to describe it clearly is death. They were now separated from God and separated from the flow of spiritual life and favor. And now they had within their souls a new force, a slavery to sin. Everything that's happened at that very moment was so drastic and extreme in every sense. Now the rest of our discussion today, we're going to try to itemize all the way that this sin in the soul now manifests itself. Opened eyes. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. The very first and most influential change was that Adam and Eve's eyes were opened. Now this is really important. We're going to spend a lot of time here because understanding this, this very first change is key to understanding all the ways that sin has corrupted our souls. Now obviously Adam and Eve had eyes that were opened before the fall, they were able to see and observe God's creation and wonder and detail that they would observe through their eyes, but something now has changed. In fact, this is exactly what the serpent predicted would happen. We'll go back to uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, and we read, The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The serpent's lies were so effective because they were based on half-truths. Information cleverly and subtly similar to truth, but misrepresented in order to deceive. It was true in a sense that their eyes would be opened, as he predicted, but it wasn't true they would be like God. It was true that they would know good from evil, but that's only because they had sinned. They based their behavior upon lies, and that awakened their conscience to let them know the sense of shame and guilt. Their eyes reflected the biggest change in their lives on that day of their death. Once, once their eyes were the portal of truth, and now their eyes are now shielded and shaded and filtered by the selfish wishes of the soul. Nakedness. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Again, prior to the fall, Adam and Eve were naked, just like it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. The difference now is perception. Everything we see with our eyes carries with it a label, like a caption on a picture in a magazine. It's a clue to help us understand how to interpret what we are seeing. Seeing their naked bodies prior to the fall was perceived innocently, tagged with a caption that was pure and strictly informational. But after the fall, seeing their naked bodies carried with it a perception of shame, which is associated with guilt. Prior to the fall, Adam and Eve had no sense of the knowledge of good and evil. But now, after the fall, they do have a conscience, a facility that was awakened to convict them of every violation of God's moral character. Now, where did this new perception come from? Why has this change come into their lives? Well, it's come because of the changes in sin. Sin's power is in the soul. The soul owns the sovereignty over the body's functions, especially eyes now. And now, if they want to see something, it's only because their body tells them they want to see this. If that look, if that glare, if that leer is now from a sense of desire or uh, lust, then that moral conscience within them is going to call that look a look of shame and guilt. Now, what this is what exactly what Jesus meant when he explained why he taught to the people in parables. Listen to Matthew chapter 13. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, You will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. This is why Jesus gave so much emphasis to clarity and purity of the eyes in the Sermon on the Mount. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then, if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad... 
your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. Have you ever wondered why two people can stand side by side and witness the exact same event and come away with two entirely different perceptions of the story of what took place? This is because corrupted souls filter visual information, assigning that information a perceptual bias, a prejudice, and a preconceived interpretation. Now, Lady Justice is always portrayed as a woman who is blindfolded. That's because visual information is always filtered by, filtered by corrupted souls and causes a bias to the story that will always be bent by our soul's uh, selfish motives. We must watch for this. We must have justice be blind. But what does this all have to do with nakedness? And to be honest, I really can't be entirely sure, but I've got some possibilities for you. First of all, we'll see in a moment that God is very interested in the fact that Adam and Eve uh, determined that they were naked. This somehow is some sort of a signal to God that they have broken and violated his rule. Of course, he knows that in advance, but he's helping Adam and Eve see that this sense of nakedness is part of a signal that God built into their souls so they can understand that a change in sovereignty has took, taken place in their lives. Their feeling of shame at the sight of their naked bodies could be just this alarm God planted within their souls. And he wants them to know that. We'll also see that souls are completely irrational, illogical, and unreasonable. And because of their feelings of shame associated with viewing their own nakedness, they then try to cover that shame or cover their nakedness to try to get rid of that, sh that sense of shame. They want to quiet the voice of their conscience at this point. And they do it in a way that's totally irrational and illogical, but they try as, as, as much as they do. Uh, the real cause of their shame, of course, is the sin that's inside of them. But this nakedness irrationally looks like the cause, and so they are trying to cover it up. Finally, just from the modern experiential uh, uh, world around us, we understand that the soul's sexual attraction can cause a lot of problems in our lives. There is so much intensity to this attraction that uh, we really must watch out for nakedness. Uh, believing that they're covering their nakedness and the shock that they received at this, this total arousal of lust within them could have been a factor in wanting them to, to calm down all that lust and attraction that was going on and covering their bodies might have quieted that down. You know, even today we know that the more flesh we show each other causes both men and women to uh, be tempted and do things that will uh, harm the peaceful world of a society uh, that we have. It can de destabilize our society. So we know that modesty is a part of a stable society. Now, well, for whatever the reason, what happens next is extremely significant. Soul tyranny. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. In response to the very intense feelings now rising up from within their souls, Adam and Eve succumb to the tyrannical, impetuous forces that demand their full obedience. They are told to cover up their nakedness, and they do it. They, they jump like robots, like slaves. They make it happen. They obey those commands because the soul is now calling the shots. Sin and its corruption are now lord of their lives, and they must obey. Now, sin really has only one rule, and that is make sure sin stays hidden. That way it preserves the ownership that it has over the being it has invaded. Now, the conscience has another rule. The conscience says, I want to expose sin. I want to make sure that this dead spirit within Adam and Eve are aware of the danger that they are in so that they can go and return to God and find some solution for the problem that they now face. But in the meantime, Sin is calling the shots, and this is the very first command that Adam and Eve jump up and obey. This is the tyranny of the soul. So desperate is this situation that they even pull sort of a, a MacGyver solution and cover themselves up comically with fig leaves, if that could ever help. Uh, but this is how powerful the soul is. They are making Adam and Eve do something even silly. The deception must continue. Sin must hide, and the shameful feelings of, of shame right now must be covered up. No, our conscience has been given to us how to help us pinpoint sinful situations like this and give us and get, get us to God to grant us deliverance from this situation. But sinful souls will do whatever it takes to quiet the voice of conscience. 
And sin's second command is very similar. Listen to what happens as Adam and Eve obey this, this second command, motivated this time by fear. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Trying to silence the screaming guilt of an awakened conscience using fig leaves is really funny. Even more hilarious is the thought that perhaps they could hide from the presence of God by jumping behind a tree or in a bush. This is the irrational nature of the soul. Feelings are very irrational. Feelings are real and powerful, but they are always irrational. Note again the 180 degree shift that's taken place between yesterday and today. Yesterday, Adam and Eve were looking forward to their fellowship time every evening with God. And now, Adam and Eve are hiding in fear from God. Is it any wonder that no one today seeks after God? If it wasn't for the fact that Jesus Christ came to this world and sought out sinners to save them, that there would be no hope for us. Jesus taught 12 disciples how to know God and preach and teach this truth to the others so that Christianity would now become the one factor in this world that helped others see their need for a Savior. Uh, if, if we wouldn't have somebody like a Christian praying for us, we would never have become Christians in the first place. If we didn't have our parents teaching us about Christ, we would not have any reason to follow after Christ. This is exactly why we send missionaries all around the world. Nobody seeks after God unless they are taught the tools they need to discover their awareness of sin and an understanding of their own need for a Savior. This is the greatest gift to this, this world, is Jesus Christ. He is our gift of awareness. We now are maturing into becoming peacemakers, just like Jesus Christ. And we are becoming ambassadors for Christ, as Paul tells us. This is our job. This is our, our purpose for living on this world. Otherwise, God could just take us home to heaven right now. But we are still here because there are people that need to understand God is searching for them, and God wants them to know the truth and make them aware of their need for a Savior. Now, the rest of Genesis chapter 3 is a dialogue. God is going to ask some questions to Adam and Eve, and through these questions, we're going to learn a few more things that are very important about the nature of our own souls. And God gives them a tool for their own illumination and awareness of sin through these questions. It's God's word that helps us understand our own need for a savior. The interrogation. Question number one. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? God knew exactly where Adam was, but Adam needed to ask himself where he was. There was a change that had taken place, not only in his position, but something deeper, a deeper change. And asking Adam where he was, was the right question to ask. Now, he is in a bush behind a tree. That's what God knows, and Adam knows that too. But he really, Adam really needs to take this question to heart and understand its deeper meaning. There has been a bigger change than just place that's gone on. Answer number one. He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. The obvious smart aleck answer would be, I'm right here. But Adam, to his credit, gives a more reasoned response and he even tells God the motivation behind why he was hiding. He tells God something he had never felt before, but he was motivated by fear. Fear is the force that arrives from the soul that has the most power in our lives. It is the most difficult to resist. Anything motivated by fear will be performed with wildest intensity. Fear is what drives us, and most of what we do is because of fear. It compels us to obey even the craziest things that we are forced to do by our souls. I challenge you to study your own behavior and see just how much fear is driving the way you do things in this world. Fear is the primary shackle that keeps us imprisoned. And in case you are wondering, there is a counterforce to fear. The counterforce to fear is faith. Once we tell our soul that God loves us, that he cares for us, and that God has the future under control, souls no longer have to fear. It's because we trust God, we put our trust in God, that fear can be eliminated. It's because we tell our souls that everything is going to be okay because God is in charge of our lives, 
then, fall, then souls calm down. When we give our souls promises, promises help keep souls happy and in joy of a future hope. And that is the power that counteracts fear. Questions two and three. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? God responds to Adam's answer with two more questions for the price of one. Now this first one we've already talked about. Somehow the awareness of nakedness was programmed into our being so that when that naked awareness came to us, we would understand that there's been a change in management. We are now ruled by a corrupt soul. No longer is God the Lord of our lives, but sin is now the Lord of our lives. It was the inevitable consequence of disobeying God that we would now have shame because of an awakened conscience, and now nakedness would be the signal that we've had that change in management. Without a spirit, now God is no longer the Lord of our lives. But we gain awareness through this new tool that we have. God is going to now give us questions that are accountability questions and help us from his word to be able to realize the danger that we're in. We have a savior and we need a savior. And it's the truth of questions of accountability like these which help us understand that. Answer number three. The man said, the woman whom you gave me to be with me she gave me from the tree, and I ate. Notice that Adam skips over question number two and jumps directly to an answer for question number three. And the reason for this is that this is actually a triggering question. Questions that are yes and no questions tend to trap souls into an incriminating situation. Souls hate yes or no questions because the answers can often expose their sin. And you know, souls do not like to have their sin exposed. They do not like to be proven to be hypocrites. They do not like to be found guilty with their own words. That's not going to work. If you back a defendant into a corner of interrogation like this, you're going to see that one answer is going to be an outright lie and the other answer is going to be the truth that incriminates them. This is something that the souls cannot have happen and they will get very creative. When this happens, stand back and watch as some really creative answers come out of their mouths. Evil gets really, really creative in situations like this. Now, the first answer you're going to get is a very common answer, especially with children. You're going to hear the answer, I don't know. I don't know. That's a very common answer. And if you're a parent and your child answers this way, then I just encourage you to just tell them, hey, you're responsible for your behavior. And there will be consequences for your behavior. But what is most concerning to me right now is that you don't know why you did what you did. I want you to understand why you did what you did because that is more important to me than the consequences and the punishment you're going to receive. You must understand why you did what you did. If you ever figure out why you did what you did, you are going to learn how to be in charge of your own soul through God's power, through the power of truth. I want to teach you that. Would you like me to help you teach, help you understand that? That's something you can ask your child in a, question, in a situation like that. Sometimes you'll get a very... Uh, very horrible answer, which is whatever, whatever. And what they mean by that is, so what if evil motivated me to do what I did? Why do you care so much? I don't care about what I did. So this kind of an answer is bad because it points it the, the blame back to the person interrogating. It says, why do you care so much? Why do you care? So it puts the, the force back on to the interrogator. The person is obviously guilty in these situations, but it puts the force back on the interrogator because it's the fault of the interrogator for caring in the first place. That's what's implied here. That's a horrible answer. Sometimes trapped souls are going to tell you an answer that's going to deflect, it's going to distract, it's going to kind of time out, it's going to delay, it's going to cause some sort of a thing that's going to kind of get you so that you no longer have the uh, focus on their behavior. This is the saved by the bell sort of situation. Eventually, if they can drag it out long enough, something's going to come up and, oh, I've got to leave, and now the problem is solved because they don't have to answer the question. You'll get that quite a bit. Now, typically, uh, people being asked questions and they're trapped in a corner will get really, really creative with their answers. Uh, they, will, they will give you an answer, but if you don't study that answer carefully, you're going to discover that that answer is really but a bunch of baloney. Uh, sometimes the interrogator is so happy to get an answer at all and to hear the person talking and start rattling off a bunch of words that they don't really listen carefully to what those words are. And most of the time, those words are just excuses. 
They're just lame excuses. If you, if you hear somebody that's giving this long story about how they've done what they did, you know they're guilty and they're just giving you a lame excuse. This is the classic, the dog ate my homework uh, type of an answer. Uh, those type of excuses are lame excuses. And more often today, you're going to find that when a soul is backed down into a corner, that that soul endures such agony because of the conviction of your just simple accountability questions that they are going to go into an emotional breakdown. This happens so much today. They will go into an emotional breakdown. Just the accountability of the simple question that's drawing into question uh, the reason and the motivation behind the behavior will cause an emotional breakdown. They're unable to cope with whatever it is that they're uh, being endure that they're enduring because of that question. They can't find an answer. You know, souls are required to behave rationally. If they don't have a rational answer for their behavior, souls go into a giant emotional breakdown. If souls do go into a breakdown, you might actually find that that's a good thing. You can find some hope in an emotional breakdown if you let it play out and go in and then ask the very calming questions. Do you know why you did what you did? Would you like to understand why you did what you did? That's actually a good thing. But you will also find emotional breakdowns are, an, are just a ploy. A ploy to get the interrogator to find some pity and compassion and relieve them of this interrogation so that the accountability questions are relaxed and that the, the interrogation stops. Don't let that happen. If it is just a ploy, make sure you keep the focus on the interrogation questions. Now, along these same lines, when somebody is challenged as to why they behave the way they do, they often understand that this is a challenge to why they believe the way they do, because we must have an answer for why we believe the way we do. We must have an answer for that. In fact, all our behavior ultimately comes down to being based on what we believe in the long run. So when they turn in this situation, these people that don't have an answer for the way they believe will turn the tides and give you a counter accusation back at you. This will help take away the force of why they don't have to answer for what they believe. Now they're going to make you answer for what you believe in the way they do that. So this is happening today a lot. They can't debate the reasons for why they believe what they believe, but they can call you back some sort of a name, a name calling situation. And I'm going to put on the screen some of the things that you'll get called if you get into this situation. Don't back down. This is proof that you've won the battle already. If you get these counter accusations labeled or uh, leveled back at you with these labels and name calling, uh, that means you've won. Uh, souls without a good excuse will often do well, what about blank? And you fill in the blank. And they'll come back with a what about? Well, what about this? Or what about that? What they're doing is they're admit admitting guilt. But they're just trying to tell you that, oh, you're guilty of the same thing. So your accusations, your accountability questions don't count. Uh, the questions that you're asking me to explain my behavior, you're going to have to answer the very same questions so you don't have a right to ask, ask those questions. These are the kind of things that come back with a what about type of an answer. Well, what about this. Somebody else is doing it already. What about that? Or somebody else did they didn't get caught. What about that? You're just as big of a hypocrite as I am. So what about that? These are confessions of guilt. And you'll see that quite often. Adam's response is another flavor of deflection uh, that's very common you'll find today. And this is basic finger pointing, blame shifting. This is pointing the finger. He did it, not me. I, somebody else did it. It wasn't me. Uh, this is the I am a victim sort of a thing. And it happens quite often. It's an admission of guilt, but it also kind of distracts from the whole argument of what's the cause, what's the motivation behind the evil. You'll be have to watch for those. And this is a classic one that Adam has come up with right here. It would have been far better if Adam had just had confessed to what he did, owned up for what he had did, and taken responsibility for what he did. But the sad part is that Adam has said something in this war, in this. Uh, in this finger pointing, which is actually just a little bit true. The problem did start through Eve. Question number four. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? Now God turns to Eve in this situation, asks an entirely new type of question. Up to this point, we've had very direct questions, yes or no questions, questions that demand an answer and a cause and a justification. But now, there's no justification here. All God is asking Eve to do is just replay the recorder 
and give us a, a rundown of exactly what took place. What is it that you have done? Can you please describe for God what you have done, Eve? Now, all these accountability-laden questions are very heavy. This is an open-ended question, and it's going to be very interesting to see how Eve answers it. Because remember, what we perceive through our eyes and our understanding of now being filtered and shadowed and darkened by the sin of our soul. So it is a very likely case that Eve might come up with a twisted sort of sense of what the story is now. Uh, but we're going to see that her answer is actually pretty good. You know, we're all equipped with a built-in body cam. Uh, but as was mentioned before, these body cams can record the wrong thing. So it's very difficult for us to have accurate body cams. That's why we need multiple witnesses of a certain crime that's been, play, been, been committed so that we can get an accurate picture of what took place. Even though we all have this body cam running, the body cam might actually be recording the wrong thing through filters or being repeated incorrectly because of the corruption of the soul. It's very important that we replay our body cams accurately and truthfully. It's so important that this is actually the, one of the Ten Commandments. Number nine says, you shall not bear false witness. You will replay your body cam accurately and truthfully every time. Answer number four. And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Thankfully, Eve's answer is a very good answer. She understands this whole matter, has given it some thought, has gone back through all the events that she's been a part of, and now has exposed them to some analysis by hindsight, and even comes up with the fact that there's been a tool that's been used on her to pry the truth out of her life and put in a substitution of lies. She recognizes that now, and this tool is deception. She was deceived. It was a ploy that changed the way she anticipated the consequences of moral behavior, and it came up with the wrong answer because of this deception, and she recognizes that. So, our interrogation is now over. It's time for God to share with us the consequences. There are some really interesting insights we can gain from these consequences. The serpent was relegated to become the least of God's creatures and was given a prophecy of doom against him. Adam received very severe judgment in his consequences. You recall that Adam was drawn from the earth, and so the earth no longer is his friend. That's his curse. Likewise, Adam is no longer going to be an immortal being. He is now a mortal being with a finite lifespan, and after he dies, his body will then return to the earth. Eve also receives uh, her consequences. Remember that Eve was drawn from Adam, and Eve's consequences all relate to Adam. She's no longer Adam's friend in the new world order. Now, now Eve was given uh, three consequences as well uh, that are that are kind of have some insights for us. The first one is that Eve is going to now uh, be fulfilling the command to be fruitful and multiply by bearing children, but in childbirth, it's going to be very difficult. Every child... Birth is going to be an investment in pain. Also, uh, Eve, before the fall, would have been happy and thrilled to be the queen of, of, the, of the world. She'd be standing beside her king, and the two would live in unity and perfection together. But now she no longer wants to be queen of the world. She wants to instead, uh, she has a hunger to control and manipulate and dominate over her husband. And also, the husband that she thought was her friend is now no longer a friend because he is going to seek to now establish his dominance over her, his rule over her, probably with a little bit of violence. And now this is not going to be the perfect unity of marriage that they thought they were going to have. It doesn't take a PhD in social work to realize that there were some really heavy uh, burdens now left upon uh, women through these curses. Uh, these are very difficult times for women. They do get the short end of the stick on many of these situations. But do recall that the sin and death brought into the world was brought into this world through Adam, not through Eve. Adam deserves all the blame for what has happened, not Eve. Uh, and Adam's curse, which brought death to this entire world and the suffering of sin to everybody in it was not Eve's fault. It was Adam's fault. So Eve does suffer a lot in this world, but we all suffer because of Adam's sin. Let's talk about the summary of tyranny. A summary of tyranny. Let's go back and talk about all the changes that have happened since the fall of man that are brought bound to us by the disobedience of Adam and Eve. Remember that our souls now have full control 
over our eyes. We only see what our soul wants us to see. Everything that we see is now being filtered, it's now being darkened, it's now being biased, prejudiced, and perceived in a new way through the selfishness of our own souls. Now, souls will also prioritize the silencing of our conscience. We no longer want to hear the accountability of our own conscience. We want to now be free of any accountability whatsoever, and so we silence our conscience at every possible time. The soul is now master of our, of our powers, of our, our being. We now obey the soul. The soul is now in charge. The soul is our Lord, and now we do everything that the soul wants us to do. Now, we do have a new tool. Genesis chapter 3 talked to us about a new tool. God's questioning, God's accountability, God's word is now the tool that gives us the ability to recognize our own sinful natures. We can now see our sinfulness through God's word. His truth and his questions allow us to find truth about our souls. Satan's questions only allowed uh, Eve to become deceived, but God's questions allow us to become enlightened. So use God's word to help us find the problems in our souls and find the cure, which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've also been told through Genesis chapter 3 that there's hope. There are prophecies. There are new things that are coming that we have to look forward to. We have hope that we can be set free from our body of death and sin. So this is what we learn in Genesis chapter 3 as well. The trump card that our souls play is the trump card of fear. We respond to fear. We do everything to submit to fear all the time. Fear is the biggest power in our souls. And we obey these fears mindlessly like robots and we just take care of it. Sinful souls cannot let sin become exposed. We will do whatever it takes when held accountable to our sin to lie about it, to deflect about it, to point the finger to somebody else about it, to counter uh, accuse uh, somebody of, of this matter. We will come up with uh, finger pointing and blame others. We will do whatever it takes to hide our sin from being exposed. Sin will no longer allow us to talk about anything about our own sin. Sin will never own up to its own faults or failures. Finally, we learned that uh, in marriage, we now have a cause for what causes so many problems in marriage. Our own sinful souls, which would have brought Adam and Eve perfect unity in marriage, now is dividing marriages right and left. There's now powers within our souls, which are selfish, which now bring uh, a lot of difficulty to our marriage experience. Unless you are aware of just how powerful these factors of uh, corruption are and dysfunction in our souls, your marriages will be almost impossible to be sweet. But again, we do have hope. Jesus Christ allows us to be set free from this, and we now have freedom over from sin. We not, don't have freedom from the presence of sin, but we have freedom from the power of sin, and we can find mercy and forgiveness from the Lord. And this will now give us unity in our marriages as well. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list. Genesis chapter 3 is a really good list to get started on, but it isn't an exhaustive list. We need to go to Genesis chapter 4 and Genesis chapter 6 to see other things that come into play because of the sinfulness of the human soul. But Good thing Paul summarizes this all for us with a horrifying list from, Genesis, uh, from Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now Jesus offers his own list to us as well from Matthew chapter 15, verse 19. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. If you are starting for the first time to finally understand the true nature of your own soul, then this is actually very healthy for you. If you thought you were a good person and now your opinion has changed, you are on the right track because this whole matter is extremely important. We are damned if we don't understand how we are uh, cursed by God with the curse of death. And this is the only solution we have is to understand that God's word will lead us to an awareness of our own need for a savior and take us to the foot of the cross where we can find salvation in the blood of Jesus Christ. 
Now, after Jesus Christ immediately expressed to Nicodemus uh, the love of God which has come into the world, he also then turned to Nicodemus and explained to him exactly what we've studied in Genesis 3, how the other force in this world of sin has affected us. This is in John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Our only hope of ever being free from sin is to repent of the dark direction our souls want us to go in and turn instead to follow the light of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone here who has just had their eyes opened to the corruption of their own soul and the hopelessness of our lives without a Savior. Father, help everyone here to turn their hearts to Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. For I pray in Christ's name, amen.